Hello. Good morning, everyone. It is so wonderful to see you all ready to dive into Lane of Goa's history on a Sunday morning. And when we want to dive into Goa's lane, which is history lane, who uh, else to be a better guide than today's more Sunday speaker and a very known Dr. Kirkir? He needs no introduction. We all know that he's a passionate artist and has carved a very fine niche for himself in the art world of India. Only a passionate artist can leave a successful medical career to become a full-time artist, which he did 30 years ago. He is an avid reader with a keen interest in history which come across in all his artworks. The Museum of Goa is living evidence of his deep connection with Goa's past. We have come a long way from connecting people through art. One was starting the Museum of Goa in 2015 and now through Mok Sundays where I have the opportunity to introduce him, the one who started it all. So good care for everyone. Okay. Thank you very much. Welcome to the Mock Sunday. Today we live in times where we are making history, or perhaps I will say where history is being made up. Usually we elect governments to change our future, but today we have a government who is changing our past by making up history. History is a very complex subject. I'm not an academic historian, but I thought I will create a little experiment to tell you how complex this subject is. I'm going to do, uh, I'll, I'm going to request my friend Punnappa, a uh, very important cartoonist. He is, uh, he draws his regular column in uh, many newspapers and I'm an avid reader of Punnappa. He has an Instagram page. I will just request him to go out for a minute. And he is with Jyoti, his wife. They live together and they have come here together. Jyoti can stay here. Yeah, you can go out for a minute. Whatever you say. So. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now Jyoti and Punnappa live in the same house and they have come here together. I am going to ask Jyoti to stand up and please tell us within half a minute what happened this morning. <laughs> yeah, you, you can take this mic. What happened? Yeah, just what happened this morning. Yeah. No, no, whatever. You, you, whatever interesting happened this morning. Um, I had to coordinate with my courier guys for the return packet. <laughs> a courier came? A courier. No, he didn't come. So, because we landed up here, you see. Okay. So, okay, so you're waiting for the courier. So I had to coordinate with my portly outside my door. Then I said, pick it up. Then I called three people, my neighbors. And uh, Olapa and I had an argument coming this way because he wanted to turn left. I said, right. Okay, so that's normal. That's yeah, okay. okay. Thank you very much. Now let's call Punnappa. <laughs> Are we not going to listen to this yeah, yeah. story? <laughs> this story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Punamba, will you please tell us what happened this morning? Oh, many things happened. So yeah, come, come. Yeah. And, and uh, my wife is, uh, you know, she knows a lot of things. She talks everything as soon as she wakes up. Even when she's dreaming, she talks okay. about to me. I really wouldn't know yeah. what she said. But yeah. one particular thing happened. I, we both decided on our own to wear white. Okay. And which we are. Okay. And uh, I wore this um, pyjama trouser of mine, mm -hmm. which I bought myself. And yesterday, my wonderful wife got me two trousers and she asked me if I wore them. I said, no, I'm wearing this one. Okay. So, thank you. I won't tell you anything more. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but anyway, here we have a little example of <laughs> two people living in the same house and describing what happened in the morning and we have had completely two different descriptions one was basically concerned about the courier picking up something and uh, um, the other one about a white pyjama <laughs> uh, so now welcome to history this is precisely history 
<laughs> you can have varied descriptions of what happened in, in the past and uh, that's why we never say history, I prefer to call it histories of Goa. Um, there is never one history and history is not exactly about uh, uh, sort of rulers and reforms. It's essentially, I think, about dialogues, of, uh, cultural dialogues, civilizational dialogues across, uh, across uh, boundaries and lived lives. I think Kosambi, who came from Goa, uh, basically almost redefined history the way we narrate history. And uh, I'm not a qualified historian, so what I'm going to do today is essentially talk to you about some of the interesting aspects of Goa's history which are not in the popular memory. Um, we, everybody talks about Parshurama created Goa. Hmm. Now, I mean, this is a mythology, and I feel it is much more than a mythology. It's a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy by the so called Brahmins to sort of claim the ownership of the land. And it's a conspiracy that they had a Brahmin put up there so that he threw an arrow and then the land is ours so they can then have a legitimate right to that land. So this Parshuram is not a mythology but a conspiracy, that's what I believe. <laughs> uh, well, in Goa, we have a very uh, interesting definition about who is the Goan. We recently had an election. And one of the parties which basically talked about Goikar Pon, I mean many parties talk about Goikar, every, every party talks about Nij Goikar, Khoro Goikar, I'm the true Govan. But let me tell you, something which is a pure Govan is a complete myth again. Because there is nothing called pure culture, there is nothing which is pure. Pure culture is like having a non-peeing area in a swimming pool. <laughs> it does not exist. So there is nobody who I could describe as a pure Goan. Uh, there is another very interesting thing which happens in Goa. I have a very close friend whose name is Padma Kumar Nair. Now Padma Kumar Nair's father was born here in Goa. He is born here. He speaks Konkani better than me. But he is not a Nair. He is a Nair. Now he is considered by law outsider. Uh, because he is born here. His father is born here. Now we have Mingal Fernandez. Now Mingal Fernandez lives in Canada. He is born in Canada. His father is born in Canada. And once after maybe some ten, I mean, first time in his life at the age of 25, he comes to Goa. But he is considered Nij Goikar, Koro Goikar. <laughs> That's because I mean, he is a Mingal Fernandez. And this Nair is not considered. So Mr. Padmakumar Nair, my friend, is seriously considering changing his name to Naik. <laughs> that should be too difficult. And then he becomes a real Goan. So, you know, the, the, uh, people started leaving in this land, which is called Goa, I think, uh, according to archaeologists, about uh, eight, ten thousand 10,000 years ago. And we have Uzgaimar, which is... Uh, in uh, Sangay Taluka, where we have petroglyphs, which is the first indication that we had some uh, settlement on this land. Now, ocean has played a huge role in determining Goa's history. For that matter, all histories of all coastal places all over the world are basically written by the ocean. Because the ocean is not just uh, something which gives physical things like the fish and it's also something which has brought ideas, which has brought people and so many things have come through the ocean and gone through the ocean. I feel ocean is a medium of intercontinental cultural diffusions because there is also a paradox there. You know the oceans have separated the continents. Well, there, there's a continental drift and the continents got separated. But paradoxically, it's the ocean which united the continents. Because the first shake hand across continents happened through the ocean. And we had Arabs coming to the coast of India right from the Arapan civilization, 2000 BC, in Lothal, which is uh, uh, one of the oldest port in the world. We had Arab ships coming. We have records of uh, Harappan coins being found in Oman and many other places. So there has been a kind of a, a 
connection uh, between uh, nations, between continents, through the ocean, right from times immemorial. And so I feel that the ocean is a kind of a medium of intercontinental cultural diffusion. And the oceans have not just written, uh, created patterns on the sand of Goa or patterns on the rocks, but the oceans have carved out our culture. And if we consider that our culture is a sculpture, who is the sculptor? And my answer is the sculptor is the ocean. And I would also make a statement that our cultures, our civilizations are born in the wombs of the ocean. And ocean creates civilizations. So this was a work I did in Dubai Art Fair, the first Dubai Art Fair, where I carried boats from Goa, sculptures created out of boats from Goa, and placed them next to Burj Arab, uh, commemorating, celebrating this uh, uh, cultural dialogues through ocean. These are petroglyphs of Uzgaimal I just spoke about. And uh, interestingly, if you study the petroglyphs anywhere in the world, uh, whether it's in a Mesopotamian civilization or South American, there's so much of similarity. And uh, uh, so th th that's why I basically feel that we don't have, nobody has a monopoly on all this kind of uh, ideas of mother goddess, etc. So now this is uh, amphora pot, uh, a Roman pot where they stored liquor, wine. And this is sitting in the Pilar Museum in Goa. There was excavation done there for building a school and what they found were some Roman artifacts. So Romans have been coming here right from the second, third century and so we have had uh, a lot of evidence. For example, if you go to Kolhapur, they found 10,000 Roman coins in Kolhapur. So uh, this was a trade route where they came to Goa because Goa was always an important port. The importance of Goa is because it was a great port and it was a port which was used by Arabs. Arabs were the main traders and uh, they, uh, everybody came here. So Europeans have been coming to Goa much, much before Vasco da Gama discovered the sea route. Vasco da Gama did not discover India. Vasco da Gama only discovered the alternate sea route to India because the route to India passed to the Red Sea. So everybody came from the Mediterranean, came to Alexandria, then they came, uh, there was no Suez Canal at that time, so they crossed, the, they came through the Nile and then came to the Red Sea and from Red Sea they came to, uh, the, the traders would bring all the spices. For example, in Vienna, in the museum in Vienna, there is a little piece of paper which is called the Papyrus Musiris. Now this Papyrus Musiris is from the 6th century and what is interesting about this Papyrus Musiris is it's a document, it's a contract between a Malu, Malayali merchant who is signing a contract with an Arab merchant in Egypt and for getting a loan from a Roman bank. <laughs> so he wants a loan from the Roman bank. So this paper is a contract between the Malayali and the Egyptian trader that, okay, this much of pepper and this much of spices will be supplied to you over this much of period and on the basis of that contract. So this paper exists. And so we had a very vibrant trade. Uh, for example, in the uh, 50 AD, St. Thomas uh, came to Kerala and the first church was not set up in Europe but in India. And why did this happen? Because there was an active trade between uh, Musiris and uh, in, uh, the Red Sea. And so it was just obvious that even Christ could have been influenced by Buddha. Hmm? So we uh, had had an active trade and the trade was very, very vibrant. Now everybody today talks essentially about uh, the Portuguese influence in Goa. Of course it is true that Portuguese have a huge influence in Goa, but there are many things which are not in popular memory and which are pre-Portuguese influences. So I will begin to talk with, uh, of course I will give you a chronology of who ruled here that we will come to, but what is interesting is what are the pre-Portuguese influences here? And I would say that the most important influence on uh, Goa, or for that matter the west coast of India, is from the Arabs. And this was much before Islam was established. Islam was established in the 7th century. But much before Islam was established, people have been coming as traders. And they were uh, tall, handsome men, rich, rich traders. In Kerala, if you go, the Muslim community has a wonderful name. They are called Maplas. Now, what is the meaning of Mapla? You know, Mapla means son-in-laws. You know, much before Islam was established, the Arab traders came and uh, the local people offered their daughters in marriage 
to the Arab merchants and they were called Arab merchants were called Maplas and that name is still stuck to the Muslim community of Kerala and so uh, this trade existed and let me tell you the Portuguese came here when they came here they came with a vengeance against the Muslims because as you know Muslims were controlling the Iberian Peninsula for a long time they were ruling uh, they were ruling uh, Portugal Spain Italy and so there was a, uh, then they were chased out from there. But there was a vengeance against Islam. And so uh, the, the Portuguese, when they came, they had this vengeance. And on the, when they took over Goa, uh, in the first attempt they uh, took over, but they failed the second attempt, they slaughtered 10,000 Muslims, men, women, and children. A letter written by Alfonso de Albuquerque, the king, mentions that. So 10,000 Muslims were slaughtered in just four days' time in Old Goa, but in spite of that, if you ask, if I ask you, who is the patron saint of Goa? Saint Francis Xavier, what is he called? Going to Saheb, and Saheb is an Arabic name. So one couldn't get rid of the Arab influence, in spite of having such a kunnas, such an animosity against Islam. Mother Mary is called Saibin, it is an Arabic name again. Every Catholic in Goa, when you uh, want to say, of, say sorry, is Saiba Bogos. Now, what is Saiba Bogos? Saiba, Sahib is uh, the Sahib in Arabic, uh, the, the God now here in this case, and Bogos is to forgive me. And that's the Arabic word. So, then I was just going to take you to some of the Arabic words which we have. Mandavi, one of my friends, his daughter is called Mandavi. Now, when I started finding out what is the meaning of Mandavi, Mandavi is a custom post. Because the most important building on a river was the custom house. And so, uh, the money came from there. And so, Arabs controlled the trade. So, the custom house was called Mandavi. And that's how the river Gomati uh, became Mandavi River. We, do, we have Mandavi rivers all over the country. And when you go to Gujarat, Mandvi is an important port. That's because it was a custom post. So Mandvi is a bazaar, Fasal, Kabul, Karz, Chabuk, Dang. Dang is um, Dang in doing what I'm doing. Hak, Bandar, Akkal. Here in Goa, in Kokkani, we say Akkal Shunya Marathon. <laughs> so Akkal. Akkal is an Arabic word. Uh, these are very few words I have selected, but there are many, many words. There are hundreds of words. Hmm? Uh, Bag, Ajab. Ajab is a very pure Kokuni word. Uh, ajab zale, huh? So uh, even in the villages, uh, this word is used. Very, very far in Marathi, for example, they use the word now. Now for nauka. Now is a Portuguese word. Now is not a Marathi word. And so even, I mean, in all the coastal belt, the Arab influence has been so much and it lingers. Uh, Khuni, Sai, even many places here like Anjuna. Anjuna, anything starting with A, uh, where Anjuna is an Arabic word. Uh, Tamarind has a nice story. You know, in uh, Arabia, dates are called Tamar. They're called Tamar. And the Arabs called Imli, Tamar A Hind. So that Tamar A Hind became Tamarind. So there are hundreds of examples of how the Arab culture the Arab influences continue in our day-to-day -day activities. Oh, most of my Hindu friends, especially if they belong to uh, a certain right-wing side, will be surprised that Akash Kandil, Akash Kandil, which we celebrate with Diwali, is a Muslim influence. It, the name itself is Kandil. Kandil is an Arabic word. So Akash Kandil is a takeoff from Mohram. Uh, not Mohram or one of the Muslim f festivals where they light up a lot of kandils. And so that was adopted. And somebody told me, which I don't know, and not just somebody, a uh, historian from Portugal mentions to me that even the idea of immersion of Ganesha is taken off by the immersion of the, uh, 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 of the uh, 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 certain uh, structure they create for a celebration in Islam. Uh, I'm not very sure about it, but this is what was pointed out by one of my friends who is a historian in Lisbon. So, so we have had so much of Arabic influence and, and it continues. And uh, 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 let me tell you, the food lecture I had given I think some weeks ago, so I will not repeat everything which I said. Uh, but then in food, even the most staunchest RSS person uses hing for the tarka. And hing is still produced only in Iran. So it's a Muslim tarka which is given by everybody. 
<laughs> so now we have had Goa was ruled by many people, and most of them, uh, I mean, before the Portuguese came, were from Karnataka. So Kannada was the official language of this territory. First of all, Goa, the way we see Goa today, was never that, uh, th this was not a geographical territory which was uh, Goa. This is only because of the historical accident of Portuguese coming here, and they ruled this po portion, and that's why this is Goa. And I will come to that. But so today's uh, sort of place which we call Goa is not something which is continuing for uh, times immemorial. This is only uh, what the territory which was ruled by Portuguese before they left. That is what is present day Goa. But then uh, there were many kings. It was part of the, uh, the, the, the peninsula. And whoever ruled the rest of the country ruled Goa. It was not something different. Uh, so Kannada kings ruled here a lot. Mm, the, some of the most important uh, rulers here were from Karnataka. And look at so many Kannada words which have come here. So many words which we speak, uh, we use in Konkani, of course, almost five, six hundred words are Portuguese. But then there are is Islamic words, Arabic words, and there are Kannada words. Uh, Bambolim was Bomohalli. So the names of the places were Kannada. Bomohalli, Kalangut or Kalyangude. That became Kalangut. You know, the, the Portuguese had won this interesting contribution. Whatever they heard became the name of the place. <laughs> uh, the most, most important thing was, when they first came to Kalikat, in Kalikat there was a Raja. His name was Samudra Raja. Now, they could not get that Samudra Raja. They heard Zamorin. And so you open any textbook of history anywhere in the world, there is no Samudra Raja, there is only Zamorin. <laughs> so whatever they heard became the name of the place. The same thing has happened with the surnames of many people who went as bounded labor. Uh, the British officers sat there and took down the name and whatever he heard became the surname. So if you go to uh, many of these islands uh, where bound, I mean, indented laborers taken, their surnames are Indian but a new version of the Indian names. Uh, so, uh, so Kalangut is Kalyan Gude, Panji or Panjan Halli. Panjan Halli was the name of Panjim, it was not Panjim. So Portuguese added uh, im to everything. It became Panjim, Bambo Lim. So I am is a Portuguese uh, uh, addition to all this thing. Uh, Narle, the, the Nariel, coconut is Narle in, in, in Canada. So Naral, Nariel na, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an influence of Canada. But how the word coconut came is very interesting. Uh, when, if you see a coconut with three holes, a uh, coconut which is cleaned up, this three, it looks like a monkey head. And in Portuguese language, macaco is a monkey head. So Portuguese must have said this is macaco nut. And the macaco nut became coconut. There could be other versions that coco is also the head. So there could be, in Spanish, but there could be other versions. But this looks like, this seems like a very uh, plausible explanation that macaco nut becomes coconut. And it does look like a monkey. Um, we have uh, kaman, arch, uh, chindu. Chindu is a ball, which is used in Marathi as well as in Konkani, is a Kannada word. Uh, nantar, nantar is afterwards, which is a word which is used in Goa. And uh, butti, the basket. Uh, bago, ben. Uh, the blind guy, kuddo, is a Kannada word. Uh, it, uh, chiller, chiller is a change, is a Kannada word. Sans. Pathway, green. So there are so many words which are uh, Kannada words, and interestingly, uh, we have even evidence of Marathi being written in Kannada script. You know, Konkani is a unique language which is written in four scripts. It's written in uh, Devanagari, it is written in uh, Roman, it's written in Malayalam, and it's written in Kannada. But there was a time when even Marathi was written in Kannada script. Uh, that's because uh, the rulers were. Uh, uh, the, the, the Kannada rulers and so so that's why I'm trying to bring across one point that is nothing which is pure there is always sort of mixture of many things the cultures found uh, formed out of mixtures so now let's take the uh, this is the geographical Goa uh, as we see it today but then Portuguese did not rule the whole of Goa in 1510 1510 the Portuguese took over Goa Alfonso de Albuquerque. At that time, he took over only by only Ilias, one which is red. That was in 1510, uh, the red portion, which was the old Goa harbour. 
The old Goa harbour was one of the most important harbour. So important, it was a harbour which was one of the most prosperous harbours in the world. Much, much bigger than London. Much, much bigger. That's because of the trade. London was just forming at that time. Hmm? The population of London in 1560 was 50,000 and the population of old Goa was 2 lakhs. 200,000. Four times bigger than London. And ships from all over the world, I mean, from the uh, Southeast Asia, from, uh, uh, from the Persian Gulf, Red Sea, uh, thrown onto Old Goa. So it was a very, very important port. Uh, and so this is what was taken over. And the Portuguese only had the possession of Ilias, that is Old Goa, for about 45, about 30, 40 years. Afterwards, they took Bardes, which is in yellow, and Salse. So this was acquired by the time of 1545, uh, they acquired this portion. And then the rest of the portion was acquired much later, almost up to more than 200 years later. Uh, that was not acquired that time. And uh, the portion uh, here, there is a little calendar which says 1510. At the bottom there, you can see 1510 is the red area, 1545 is the yellow area, and 1780 is the green area. So from 1510 to 1780s, many, many years, 270 years. So uh, this was acquired after 270 years. So here we go. In 1763, Ponda, Sange, Kepe and Kankona were acquired from the Maharaja of Sondekar Maharaj, Sondekar Raja. They still have a, a little palace in Bandoda. I, it's a rather pathetic story. I had had a personal encounter with them. Uh, you know, the Maharani there, the present day Maharani thought that I am somebody important and I could convince the government to convert that into a museum. So they connected, contacted me and me and my friend Satish Sonak, we went to see the Maharani. And uh, when we went there, the palace was not really in a very good shape. It is actually a small palace. But, they, but then I, we were accompanied by Madhvi, uh, who was one of the uh, important authors that time. She's no more now. Uh, Madhvi Desai. Uh, so she accompanied us. And uh, it was very interesting. When we entered there, Madhvi Desai, who is from Kolhapur, wife of Ranjit Desai, who is uh, one of the most important authors in Marathi, he, she went and she did a mujra. She bowed down and did that the way you do to the queen. And we also followed. I said, okay, let, them, uh, let her feel happy. And then she uh, sat down and then she opened up an album. And uh, she showed me the, uh, the pictures of the Raja Bhishek. Raja Bhishek is the uh, coronation ceremony of her son. Now, coronation ceremony which happens in uh, 2015 or so. And I said, what is he doing? He works in State Bank in Kolhapur. <laughs> yeah, so, this is, uh, it was rather pathetic, but this uh, place is acquired uh, from uh, Sondekar Maharaja and then he was given some annual uh, pension. And then in 1781, uh, there was a conflict between the Bhosles of uh, Savantwadi and Bhosles of Kolhapur. And then the Portuguese, only thing they had better than Bhosles was the better guns because they had guns from Europe. And they started negotiating, okay, we will support you, what will you give us? So uh, the uh, Savantwadi Bhosles gave uh, Bicholim and Sattari in exchange of support for the war. Uh, basically, uh, material for the war. And then in 1788, they got Pedne, again from the Bosclays of Savantwadi. Now, uh, you know, uh, if the Portuguese had negotiated a little harder and said, okay, we also want uh, Ratnagiri, huh? then all the people from Ratnagiri would say, we are real Goans. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is a simple negotiation which happened on a table in exchange of support during a war. And that's how uh, people in Pedne are Khare Goinkar. So the idea of this Khare Goinkar is a very, very, very fictitious idea. Yeah? Oh. Uh, well, the sound is bad. But this is a work which I did, which is there in the Museum of Goa, where there is a chair, which at the base of the chair keeps moving. Uh, it keeps moving because it's called the King's Chair. Uh, it's called King's Chair and I have written down all the list of all the dynasties which ruled Goa right from uh, the second, third century BC, uh, whoever ruled Goa. And uh, it basically is a chair of also hope because nobody is permanent there. Everybody is going to change. So when I look at the chair, I get hope. <laughs> yeah. So 
this is King Ashoka from the Sanchi Stupa. And since Ashoka controlled the whole of the country, and no wonder that he also controlled this area which we call Goa today. And Damodar Mauzo, who recently got the Gyanapit Award, he narrated a very nice story to me. He said, Purna was a Buddhist monk who is supposed to have met Ashoka. Hmm? Uh, I do not know from where he gets that information, but uh, it was called Purna's Cave in Margaon. Then Purna's Cave, when the Portuguese came, the Purna's Cave became Pandava's Cave. Because most of all, all Buddhist caves, uh, I'm sorry, not uh, during the Portuguese time, but before that, all Buddhist caves have been sort of adopted and they became Pandava's Caves all over the countries. And I went to uh, Arwale, near Bicholi, and uh, there is this cave, which is a Buddhist cave. And then there is inside there is a Shivalinga. So the guy who is in charge of this cave told me, look at this Shivalinga. The Pandavas came one night, during the night they carved out this Linga and in the morning they left. And they believe it. They believe it that, so all the uh, sort of, you know, there is a very interesting thing. Many temples were demolished by the, uh, by the Portuguese and the churches were set up, that's history. But then, under every temple, there is also this monastery. Because uh, Buddhist monasteries also were got rid of and Buddha was got rid of by adopting him as one of the avatars of Vishnu. So this was another Buddha conspiracy. <laughs> so we have had a lot of religious conspiracies too. And so here, this is a, a Buddha, Buddhist cave and we have many Buddhist caves uh, in Goa. And we have this sculpture which, is, which sits in the archaeological, uh, the museum of Goa, a museum of uh, the government museum, which is a sculpture of Buddha which was found in Goa. So Goa had a lot of Buddhist influence once upon a time. Now this is Bhojas, the next dynasty, 4th century was Bhojas. And Bhojas had their capital in the Chandrapur, which is the present day Chandor. Hmm? Uh, this is on the and then there, there is a there, Parvat, Parvat uh, there is a temple called Chandreshwar in Parvat and that was built by Bhojas and we have copper uh, 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 plates which were from this time the copper physical copper plates exist from 4th century hmm? then Konkan Mauryas I will not go into details about each of the empires because this is not that they were only controlling Goa they were controlling this territory and Goa also happened to be part of that territory and then we have Chalukyas and the interesting thing about Chalukyas is there was a queen who ruled. Her name was Vijaya Mahadevi. Uh, the queen, so many times we ask who is the first female ruler of Goa, everybody would say Shashikala Kakorkar. But much before Shashikala Kakorkar, we had Vijaya Mahadevi who ruled uh, Goa. Uh, these are Shilahara's coins. And then the Kadambas. See, after the Portuguese, the Kadambas were the longest rulers of Goa, about 400 years. So Kadambas ruled from 960 AD to 1356 and Kadambas again were from Karnataka, they were Karnataka kings and their deity was Saptakoteshwar. They were actually giants but they adopted Saptakoteshwar as their god and uh, uh, we have, they were uh, very prosperous kings and they were very very good uh, with the, the navy and uh, they were great traders and they had a huge port uh, where the present day uh, Goa Vella is. It was called Gopaka Pattanam. Now Gopaka Pattanam was one of the most important port and the sad part of it is there has been no excavation happening. There is a wall of the port which existed which uh, got uh, destroyed somewhere in 1340 because of some kind of a tsunami which must have come but the wall of that port still exists. And I took out, I mean, nobody is controlling there, so I brought two large stones from that wall. And I'm going to use them for some kind of a installation because uh, these stones were carved out in uh, somewhere in uh, almost more than a thousand years ago uh, by some masons of that time. So I'm going to use them in memory of this great port, and that is called Gopaka Pattanam. And it had trade again uh, with, uh, with uh, the Arabs, with the Africans, and with uh, Southeast Asia, and with China. Uh, because we have found a lot of Chinese uh, artifacts. But if the excavations happen here, history of Goa will be much, much richer. Because uh, this port, the wall is almost underwater. Only the top uh, layer of the stones is seen there. And this excavation will produce a great thing. But our politicians, unfortunately, are excavating something else to fill up their pockets. <laughs> and they don't have time for this kind of things. Uh, this is the 
this, the symbol of the Kadambas, the lion, the lion has been a symbol of almost every, every uh, uh, I mean, empire. It's a very common symbol. Uh, somebody just uh, told me that the uh, lion is also the national, uh, national animal of India. But he said, in India, we have more asses than lions. <laughs> the, 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 the peacock is the uh, national bird, but then we have more crows than peacocks. <laughs> so uh, the lion is excavated again during an excavation for a school building in Pilar uh, Seminary. And they found a lot of interesting artifacts. And uh, uh, the father there has set up a very nice museum. And I've been speaking to him on many occasions, and it's really worth going and seeing. Of course, it's not really like a museum, it's almost a storehouse of those artifacts, but still, it's very, very interesting. So this sculpture is there, and it was excavated during uh, the uh, building of the school. This is the temple of Tamdi Surla. Now, this Tamdi Surla was discovered by one Mr. Dume, who was an archaeologist, who was a historian, a very good historian. He was a hobby historian, but uh, uh, Sheikh Ali, who was a vice chancellor of Goa University, had a very nice thing to say about Mr. Dume. He said, Mr. Dume worships history like uh, priests worship gods. So he was really a worship of history. And uh, this is uh, Tamdi Surla temple, the only temple in this language, which is the uh, architecture of Karnataka, which exists in Goa. If you go to Saligaon church, you will find a lot of black stones, which are very similar. And perhaps there was a temple there before, because we find, uh, this is, this is uh, not guesswork. We have a Portuguese record of every demolition of every temple, the Portuguese record. Uh, and again, when I talk about this, I talk about this as history. I make it uh, because many times when I talk about this, the many right wing fellows feel Hamara <laughs> Yadmi. <laughs> but the thing is, I talk about it as history and I basically write a footnote to it that I have absolutely nothing against the present day Christians and the present day Portuguese because they have nothing to do with what happened 450 years ago. Uh, that is very, very important to know. It should not lead to any animosity, but history has to be studied. Hmm? So this is the Tamdi Surla temple, which was uh, constructed by, I think, Jai Keshi. And this is the wall I was talking about, which is there in Goa Villa. So this is the wall, which was uh, Gopaka Patanam, and after that, uh, it was shifted, the port got silted in 14, 1340, and it was shifted to Ella, which is in Old Goa. And then the port of uh, Old Goa developed. And there was one road, which was, cons this was constructed actually not by Kadambas, the, the port of Ella, but by the next empire, which ruled here, which was uh, the, the Muslim empire, I will come to that. So they constructed a path from Goa, to Old Goa, which is called Rajavidhi, and uh, that road, uh, part of it still exists. So now I have some of these stones are in the museum now. So I might be charged for stealing history, but the thing is, <laughs> so the thing is, uh, nobody is bothering about it. I thought I will do something about it. So this is uh, Malik Kafur attacks Goa in 1310, and at the head of his army, this was the first invasion which happened in Goa from the ocean, from the sea. Otherwise, all the other invasions were always on land. But this was the first invasion which happened uh, through the ocean. The ships started from Gujarat and then came and attacked. They were basically plunderers. They didn't come for any uh, establishing empires, most probably. They just came to plunder because Goa was an important port. We, that was a time when anybody plundered anybody else. If you're in the other kingdom, for example, Shivaji himself went and plundered Surat. Whom does he plunder? He plunders the Hindu merchants of Surat. Uh, he makes them stand in a row and say, give this much money, otherwise your head is cut. So this is because Surat is ruled by another king. So you have a right to go and plunder there. So that was the rule of that time. Hmm? So all kings did that. And uh, so they came as plunderers. But what is very interesting about this invasion is that at the head of the invasion was Ibn Battuta. Ibn Battuta, who is very well known as a traveler, was at the head of this invasion. He was also, I mean, in those days everybody was a soldier and traveler. And so Ibn Battuta was at the head of this invasion. Uh, so we, we have had many invasions. Tughlaq came in 1325. So it is not that, you know, history of Goa is not from this time to this time, this one rule, from this time to this time, this one. No, many of them are overlapping happening. And so it's not uh, from one place. Then the, another important ruler is the Harihara of Vijayanagar. Now, he defeated uh, the uh, Tughlaqs, the uh, army of Tughlaqs. They were the largest empire in Vijayanagar, in Hampi. And he came at the head of his army was a man called Madhav Mantri. 
Now Madhav Mantri is uh, the least celebrated name in Goa, but Madhav Mantri was a very, very important uh, general and he ruled for 10 years. Uh, and then Harihara was the uh, was a ruler in uh, Hampi, and uh, I read it from Heta Pandit's book. There is a very nice poem, which is sung even today by the Kshatriyas of uh, Kurchurim. Kshatriyas of Kurchurim sing a poem, uh, 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 Chandor, of Chandor. They sing a, poem, sing a song, it's a folk song, they sing it, and what is this song? They must not be knowing what they are singing, but this is a song, the meaning of the song is something like that. Harihar will come and we will, uh, we will offer flowers at his feet. So, the Christian community of Chandor even today is offering flowers to Harihara. They don't know who this Harihara is, but the song has lingered and this is what I call the sort of a, a, the oral history. And I mean, there are so many interesting things which have permeated through time. And how many years ago? This was in 1378. From 1378, the song which somebody was singing in praise of Harihara, the saviour, because he uh, chased out the uh, uh, Tughlaqs and took charge of Goa, is continues to be sung even today. Because that is history. <laughs> so, uh, the Vijayanagars had a very huge role to play. The Vijayanagars were defeated somewhere in 1560. The Portuguese uh, uh, came here then, uh, after, after the uh, Vijayanagar empire. Goa was taken over by the Adil Shah of Bijapur. The Adil Shahi and the Portuguese got rid of uh, the Adil Shah. This is the Adil Shah. Uh, this, is, this is a painting done by my friend um, Kalidas. So uh, he is hunting. But another interesting aspect of Adil Shah of Bijapur was he was a great musician. So recently I was studying some miniature paintings and he is there sitting with a tambora. So he was also a great connoisseur of music and he was defeated by the Portuguese in 1510 and Goa was taken over by the Portuguese. Now, uh, you know, Goa is the first, I would say, the second European power to capture a territory in India. The first was Alexander the Great. So that was way back in 400 and, uh, I think, uh, 430 BC. There was Alexander and then after that, Alfonso de Albuquerque was the second European to actually capture a piece of Indian land. So Goa was the first territory to be colonized. And the Portuguese were great seafarers. I think the age of exploration, I mean Vasco da Gama lands up in India, in Calicut on the 25th of May, uh, 1498. And I will show you the picture of it. So, uh, I think I already explained to you that earlier the trade was through the Red Sea and then they wanted to find an alternate route to India, that's how they came uh, because they found that the Arabs had become so rich with the spice trade and the Arabs had spent a lot of myths about the spices. They said we have to go all the way to India and fight the snakes and then the spices grow in the trees and we have to get the spices, that's why they are expensive. Pepper was hundred times more expensive in Europe, hundred times. So if you uh, bought pepper for one rupee here, it was sold for hundred rupees. That is 10,000 percent profit. That is the kind of profit they got. And recently I was in a train from, uh, from Basel to Zurich and I met a professor by an accident who was an Indologist and he told me even today uh, in German language there is a word called Pfeffersack. Pfeffersack, because pepper was used by only very rich people, it was expensive, and those who had a lot of money uh, and showed off their money were called Pfeffersacks, a sack of pepper. So that word continues to be used in Germany even today, and that's history. So now, Vasco da Gama finds out this route, and he comes to Kalikat. Now when he comes to Kalikat, uh, he's coming as a trader, and he wants to meet the king, and this is the kind of a reception he gets, fairly a good reception. He is paraded with 3,000 Nayars to the court of uh, Samudra Raja, who they call Zamorin, and he has negotiations. But before that, when they are in the sea, uh, they don't know what kind of a reception is awaiting there. Because uh, you could be killed, uh, there could be violence. So first, they send somebody called Zuan Yunis. Now, this Zuan Yunis is a prisoner picked up from the jails in Lisbon. You know, these expeditions which the Portuguese were doing were so risky, uh, more than half the people died. And the rest of the half, half the people who came back were very rich. So people took chances and the prisoners had no choice. So the prisoners would anyway, okay, they were directed to go. Instead of rotting in the jail, they said, okay, here is a chance. So Zhuang Nunis was a prisoner. 
picked up from a jail in Lisbon. And so he's told, take this boat and go and check up what is happening. So he sails, he goes in a small boat to the coast of Calicut and meets three Tunisians. So the Tunisians are already here, the Europeans are already here. Uh, 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 Tunisian Africans, but they are already here. And they ask him in Spanish, what the devil brings you here? Because there is a strange ship there, which is just anchored a little bit away in the sea. And what the devil brings you here? And Juan Nunes answers, we come for pepper and we come for Christ. So the Portuguese came for pepper and for Christ. And so here is a sculpture I created, which is called Pepper Cross which is a cr cross with, uh, with uh, carvings of pepper on it. Initially, I had done this little niches with a machine to fix real peppercorns inside, but then I thought there was no need of that. So uh, this is a sculpture which is in some German collection right now. Yeah. So now here is Vasco da Gama meeting Samudra Raja, Mr. Zamorin. Now, this is a very interesting indicator. This painting is done in, uh, in, in Portugal. Uh, I don't know which year, but this is an old painting done in uh, Lisbon. Now, Vasco da Gama is wearing, see how many things there. And in 25th of May is the date. Those of you who have been to Cochin or to Kalinkat on 25th of May, we will know what is the temperature there. You will be sweating. You will be sweating profusely. And so the, the king is in the right dress. He is topless. <laughs> Because he knows that this is foolish to wear all this, but Vasco da Gama with the fur coat and all this and sweating inside. And the same agony of Vasco da Gama in this painting I see in all the bridegrooms and the things in Goa's marriages. <laughs> uh, in Goa's marriages which happen in this season, you have three-piece suit. This is, I mean, can you imagine wearing three-piece suit now and going to dancing? They're all like, soaked in sweat. Uh, so this is the beginning. This is the beginning of the three-piece suit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is a painting by Viraj Naik, which is called the Triumphant Trio. You know, the Alfonso de Albuquerque was invited by the uh, Govan merchants to come and take over Goa from the Adil Shah of Bijapur uh, uh, because they thought the taxes will be less. So Malpai Veranekar and Thimaya, who was from Onawar, both of them were sort of, uh, they had their own little army also. Timaya had about 3,000 uh, people uh, with arms. So he said, I will help you. Then make me the uh, chief of Goa and we will pay you every year some money uh, as a token of uh, you are sort of helping us get rid of Adilsha. But the Portuguese got rid of both these guys and stayed here for <laughs> 450 years. Yeah. So this is a old map of uh, old Goa. Uh, how much time do you have? Hmm? 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah. So this is um, yeah. Uh, old Goa. So <laughs> old Goa, as I told you, was a, had a population of uh, uh, 2 lakh people that time. Today's population of old Goa must be hardly some 20,000 or so, or even less, I don't know. Yeah. But uh, that time it was 200,000 and people from all over the world, all merchants of the world were here. Yeah, I will not go into the details, but uh, a lot of these churches, you know, what is it? this is very interesting. Um, I'm speaking in front of a very prominent architect, um, I'm making some architectural comment. This place became the laboratory of architecture because the Portuguese came with all the design. They didn't come with really architects. They came with drawings for <coughs> building houses. And these drawings were basically in all the European styles prevalent at that time. And not, they were not only Portuguese, because at that time the main architectural styles were Italian. Uh, and so they come with all these uh, designs and then uh, the local masons interpret the drawings and they use the local to adapt them to local material and local climate and all these churches are built. So they of course are European, uh, European architecture but a lot of things have been adopted to suit the material and the climate. So old Goa becomes a laboratory of architecture. Uh, of course, here is a laterite stone. In Europe, there is no laterite stone, so that is used. Yeah. Um, here, this catamaran I will skip because otherwise 15 minutes is less. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is the Saptakoteshwar temple in Narve, in, uh, in uh, Bicholin. Now, this temple has a very, very interesting history. Uh, according to Manohar Malgaonkar, who is a very important writer, he feels the history of this temple is an allegory of the ups and downs in the lives of the Hindu community of uh, Goa. Because Saptakoteshwar temple, as I told you earlier, was the family deity of Kadambas. 
and it was constructed by Kamala Devi and Jai Keshi in, uh, in Divar Island. Uh, the ruins of that temple still exist. There was another temple which was a Ganesha temple there. And the Ganesha temple, what was there on the top of the Ganesha, the carving of a rock which was above the deity, if you go today to the Piedad Church Cemetery in Divar, that is there where the dead body is kept. Hmm? So that piece of stone is there in the cemetery on the top. So this was a Saptakodeshwar temple which was built by the Kadambas. It was destroyed by the, uh, by the uh, Muslim invaders. Again it was reconstructed by the Vijayanagar Empire. So Harihara got it reconstructed. Again it was destroyed by the Portuguese when they came. But before it was destroyed, there's a very nice story. There's an uh, Italian uh, uh, traveler called Corsani who comes to Goa and writes a letter to his Medici, the, the, his uh, king, saying that this is such an exquisite temple and the carvings are so great that I would like to bring one of this as a gift to you. So the description of the temple exists in a letter written by this traveler to his duke in, 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 in Venice. So this temple was again now destroyed by the, uh, uh, the Portuguese. And then there is one Surya Rao, uh, uh, who is uh, one of the ancestors of my wife, uh, Savita Vijay Sardesai. He is supposed to have carried the deity to Narve. And a new temple uh, was set up. And there is a little samadhi of this Surya Rao who saved the deity. Uh, because this, uh, those days, uh, it's very interesting. The temples were demolished by the Portuguese and the deity, which was in stone, was kept next to a well. And you were supposed to put your foot on the deity and pull water uh, to prove that the deity has no power. Mm? So that was their trip. And if you go to Old Goa Museum, there is a sculpture of Vaital with a lot of ridges on the side which are created by the rope and by pulling, uh, pulling water. And so, uh, uh, this deity was also kept there and this deity was taken to Narve and it was a uh, new temple was set up. Now this is already quite a few hundred years and then in 1566 when Shivaji Maharaj comes there, uh, this area in 15, uh, 1666 was not under the Portuguese because it was only given to them much later in 1700. So Shivaji reconstructs the temple and this virgin what you see is paid for by Shivaji. But what is interesting here is he paid for a structure which is constructed in the Indo-Portuguese style. Because if you see all the temples in Goa, these temples in Goa, uh, uh, the language is the same as the Goan houses. And I will give you a few examples. So this is reconstructed by, the, by Shivaji using the same masons who were trained in the Indo-Portuguese style of architecture. And then again it becomes old, nobody bothers about it. And in 2005 or 2002, in the Sao Orient, the Portuguese organization spends maybe some 20-30 lakhs to again renovate it. So this is history. So from demolition to the temple to reconstruction, the zeal of the Portuguese to break temples lasted for a short time. After some time, Mangeshi temple was put on the Portuguese currency. Huh? So things change. So it's not that, uh, uh, I mean, the same kind of a zeal of demolishing continued. Uh, so, uh, so this was reconstructed by Findusa Orient. So at that time, if Inquisition would have tried uh, Findusa Orient and send them for auto the fay, <laughs> if Inquisition existed at that time. Hmm? So this is one of the sculptures of, Krishna, of uh, 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 Jesus in the Pilar Museum. Uh, here you see the legs of the uh, infant Jesus are crossed. And who carved these sculptures? All the Hindu carvers. And why they are crossed? Because young Krishna has always crossed legs. So this is, I call this Jeju Krishna. <laughs> That's because it's very much like Krishna. Um, this is a work by Kalidas Mamal who is sitting here. So this is about a story which happened somewhere in 1560 in the island of Diwar. The, uh, the island I mentioned. In one day, 1,500 people were converted to Christianity. And uh, when they were told that you either become Christians, because the rule was made that those who want to stay on this island should be Christians, otherwise you don't stay, you lose your land. So all the 1,500 people went to the Ganesha temple and asked God, there is something called Prasad. They put a petal there and take the permission of the God. Uh, should, what should we do? The God said, become Christians. So they became Christians, but there was a problem now. The Brahmins who became Christians suddenly realized that now we are equal to the so-called Shudras. 
so they could stand that idea Christian ठीक है but Rabbi we can't be equal to the Shudras how can we eat with them so they wrote a letter to the bishop saying that we want our right to wear the Janevu uh, we, because we want to keep our caste we can't give okay, allow so the letter goes to the Pope Gregory and Pope Gregory in 1612 sends a decree which is read out in the Se Cathedral in Old Goa which says that those Brahmins who have become Christians may wear the Janevu provided it is blessed by the bishop <laughs> so for a few hundred years the Christian Brahmins are wearing a Janevu of course, there are many, many interesting letters of this kind which have gone from different communities. I think that uh, 45 minutes is not enough to talk about this, but they're very, very interesting. There was one letter which tells the Pope that we are descendants of Adam and Eve. <laughs> uh, so, and then we have the right to be your, uh, uh, your prime ministers. Mm? They were anyway the prime minister of the Brahmin community because, you know, the, most of the Portuguese who came here were sailors. And so they did not have the uh, intellectual acumen to do big business. Uh, they could fight, but they didn't have the business mind. So most of the business associates were the local Saraswat Brahmins, including, I mean, uh, the, the, the family in uh, uh, Panji, Mamai, the, uh, Mamai is, uh, yeah. they, were, they were the partners of the governor. They were the partners of the governor because they needed some kind of business acumen to do business and that the Portuguese sailors did not have. <laughs> So, in 1720, in Salsid, there were 93.92% Christians in 1720 and 6% Hindus. So, the, the conversion, I mean, they, almost everybody was converted. Those who were not converted, I don't know why, but there are many theories. One of the theories, a lot of uh, goldsmiths were not converted. Now, it's a very uh, uh, I mean, interesting thing. Why goldsmith? Because you don't have a Christian goldsmith. You have uh, all professions we have Christians in Goa, but there's no Christian goldsmith. And why? One of the reasons, this is just a guesswork, one of the reasons that the Portuguese found a lot of gold mines in Mozambique. And then they needed the goldsmiths to extract gold. And gold was uh, more shiny than religion. <laughs> <laughs> and so they decided that okay, you come and help us, we will not bother you. <laughs> and so uh, uh, and in 1881 census, Goa had 58% Christians and in 2011 census, there is 25% Christians. So that's basically because, uh, you know, most of the migrants who came were essentially Hindus. The migrations have been happening and so most migrants were Hindus. So now normally, ideally, the, the Christian population is descending. Otherwise, the church has a very strong power in politics here. They still have the power, but the power is slowly going down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Inquisition. I think I will speak very briefly about Inquisition. Actually, Inquisition was a uh, sort of an organization which was set up. You know, suddenly I am made a Christian. I was a Hindu and I am made a Christian. What do I do? I mean, okay, I've become Christian now, but then I still, maybe will, if I'm a religious person, I will still start praying to Krishna and Rama. Or maybe if, uh, I will close the window and say, okay, Deva <laughs> Tupau. Huh? But then, uh, this was not tolerated. If you become a Christian, you have to follow the correct tenets of Christianity, otherwise you will be punished. So actually the letter to set up the court of inquisition, which was already set up in Spain way back in, I think, uh, 1411 or 12. This court of inquisition was set up in Spain and John of Arc in France was burnt alive by the inquisition court. Yeah? So we have, uh, uh, so uh, uh, there it was basically the Jews were converted to Christianity and the new Christians were Jews. And then they were not again following the correct tenets. So you proper follow the correct tenets or they will be punished. That is what was the Inquisition Code. So this was against the new Catholics. Those who became Christians but were not following uh, were made to follow otherwise you will be punished. And who reported? The neighbors reported. Because what you were told was, okay, if some you he's seen your neighbor who has become a Christian, has seen doing anything which was previously Hindu, please report. And then he will be sent to auto the fay. Uh, and then his land or field will be given to you. So again, this is, uh, the, the, the land was again uh, stronger than religion. <laughs> and so, this is what was done. And that inquisition was an organization which was for this purpose. And uh, we have very little record of inquisition. Inquisition was abolished ultimately in 1812. Also because of the British intervention. 
a uh, lot of things have happened in Goa because of the British intervention. Uh, uh, the British were more or less controlling Goa, though they were not actually ruling it. I will come to that. But then, uh, uh, we, the most authentic record of Inquisition we know from a Frenchman called Dillon. Now, Dillon comes in Goa. Uh, this is the table of Inquisition which is there in the uh, Goa State Museum. And I created a sculpture out of it. Uh, I, uh, I copied the figure from the leg of the table of inquisition, the judge of inquisition. And uh, these are, I will tell you these stories. This is from Cochin, uh, from Calicut. I will come to this. Now, Dillon comes to Goa on a Venetian ship and uh, he has studied some medicine there. He comes to Goa and he is interested in the uh, local medicine, Ayurveda. So he goes to Ponda and becomes a student of a Vaidya. And he studies uh, uh, the uh, local medicine and uh, he starts practicing that too along with his uh, uh, medicine which he has learned in Europe. And then he's a handsome man, he falls in love with the wife of a Portuguese officer and starts having an affair with her. Now the officer comes to know, so uh, I mean uh, they chase him, so he runs away, find, gets himself on a ship and goes to Surat and starts practicing his medicine in Surat. Now, in Surat, his old habits die hard. So there is a, uh, a captain called Vidal, a French captain. And he has a beautiful wife who has an affair with the governor of, Poch of uh, Portuguese governor. Now, this guy starts having an affair with her and the governor is jealous. Because this is a young, handsome French guy having an uh, affair with my mistress. So he's jealous. So he decides to teach him a lesson. So he calls him to treat his son who has high fever. So Dillon goes to... Uh, his house and he's a 10 years old boy and they have a little uh, sc sculpture of Saint Anthony tied to his uh, hand, to the arm and those days for any damn thing the treatment was bleeding so you just, <laughs> you start bleeding and they thought that it cures so he has to bleed the patient so now he says okay please get rid of this uh, Saint Anthony uh, he says, no, the sentinel will protect the child. We can't get rid of him. He says, don't talk nonsense, all this superstition. This is taken as an insult to Christianity. He's arrested. This is all planned. And sent to the jail in Goa. For three years, he remains in the jail in Goa, in the Inquisition. And then he is shifted to Lisbon in the jail. And then he was an employee of the French East India Company. And so there are some negotiations and he's set free on the condition that he will not talk about it. He goes to France back, but he does talk about it. He writes a book about his experiences. And the only knowledge we have today, uh, the first-hand knowledge about what happened during Inquisition, is by the book by Dillon. And it is available in print today. And so this is, and then uh, there, are, uh, there are also cross-checks done on this book because especially what happened in Surat and uh, so it all matches very well and we know that Dillon actually existed and he did go through whatever he is describing. So that is the story of Dillon and I must tell you uh, very interesting things which happened when the Inquisition court came. Now they had to sort of tell the Hindus who became Christians to behave in a certain way. One thing, of course, pray to only the Christian gods, not to Hindu gods, that is one thing understood. But there were many other customs which were sort of told to them and made compulsory. For example, you shall not have tell ceremony during marriage. In Hindu marriage, there is an oil ceremony, something called uh, the bride is covered with oil. But now you have to have an alternative for the tell, so they make rose. Rose is the coconut uh, water is applied uh, to the Christian bride. And then uh, the Hindus were not using salt for cooking rice. So they said, you shall use salt for cooking rice. So everything is negated. So there are, there's a list of Inquisition rules, which, is, uh, which are published by, again, this uh, Dume, who's a historian. Uh, very interesting rules. So we have some very interesting, sometimes hilarious rules, which are um, uh, there by the frame by the Inquisition code. So I think I don't have much time, so I will straight away now come to the liberation of Goa. Huh? Because otherwise it will go on. The slave trade was very, very important. I think I will come straight to the liberation of Goa. Uh, I mean, these are all these pictures which you see. Uh, basically, uh, if one has to talk about one of the most important things Goa did for the country is changing the food habit. So everything from Brazil came to Goa and from Goa it went to the rest of the country. Uh, Chile is, is the most important thing. Of course, there are many other things. Uh, you will see the pictures of it. Uh, your maize, your cashew, your peanuts, your potatoes, your tomatoes, 
bread, ananas, tapioca. Hmm? Uh, but I had given a lecture a few weeks ago about food, so I will not repeat this. Uh, but I will only tell you about the chilies. Now the chilies come from Brazil here. Yeah? Uh, and why, why from Brazil everything comes to Goa? In, you know, in uh, the age of exploration, uh, in 1500, if the ships had to come to Goa, everybody would think they will come along the coast of Africa to the Cape of Good Hope and then cross the Indian Ocean, uh, uh, Arabian Sea and come to Goa. But that was not possible because those days there was no uh, steam engine. So the ships had to go follow the wind and the currents and it had to go to the west towards America, come down almost to the South Pole and then climb up to the Cape of Good Hope and then cross the Arabian Sea. And so during one such voyage, Captain Castro, who was commanding this ship in 1500, touched Brazil. Because Brazil is like a, like a pregnant America protruding into the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> and so uh, they touched Brazil, they colonized Brazil, and Brazil became a stopover for every voyage from uh, Lisbon to Goa. And so everything from Brazil came to Goa, and everything from Goa went to Brazil. So the first NRIs of India, were Goan farmers who went to teach Brazilians how to grow sugarcane. Because uh, in, if you see the churches there, the churches are very similar like here because the temperatures were similar. And so the masons from here must have gone there. So Brazil and Goa are like sisters and I'm actually rather disappointed because we don't have much connection. So I definitely want to establish some kind of a, a artistic connection between artists of Goa and artists of Brazil, which will happen. Yeah. Uh, the sabudana I am talking about because every Hindu for the fasting use sabudana kichdi, which comes from Brazil. And so if uh, my great 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 grandson goes to the priest and says, well, fasting, what can I eat? They will say, chocolate flavor Kellogg's. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the breadfruit is from Brazil, papaya is from Brazil, sita for ram for a new nomenclature here. Uh, there it is called ather, and in Goa also it is called ather. No, sweet potatoes, tobacco, hmm? yeah. marigold flowers, whether it is a BJP victory or the Congress victory. The, the garland is always marigold from Brazil. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the French penny, the temple flower is also from the, the, you know, Hawaii. In Hawaii, there is a very nice custom. If a girl is uh, available, she puts the French penny on the right ear and not available in the left ear. <laughs> I'm making a mistake about uh, which year. <laughs> yeah, the, Bogan, the, the, the Gulmohar tree has a very nice history. You know, Gulmohar comes from Madagascar. See, the Portuguese are responsible for bringing so many things from one place to the other. Uh, in 1560, there was a Portuguese caravela passing along the coast of Madagascar. And there's a very interesting noting in the logbook of this ship. It says, we saw a sunset on the wrong side of the sky at the wrong time of the day, and we disembarked. This was the first time that a European saw forest of Gulmohar trees. And then they took the Gulmohar pods to all tropical and subtropical areas of the world. And today we have Gulmohar all over. We have in Australia Gulmohar, we have in Delhi Gulmohar. So Gulmohar is everywhere. Architecture I already talked about. I will only make a very small uh, observation, uh, which is, uh, oh, this is interesting, not for sale. These days, the all Goan houses, the people don't write for sale, not for sale. Because inside every Dilliwala, there's a Goan trying to come out. <laughs> yeah? And they want to come and buy a house. Yeah. So we have to do this, then house not for sale. Yeah? So this is the St. Kajitan Church in Old Goa. And you look at the dome of this church. And then you look at the dome of the Mangeshi Temple. They are precisely the same. They're precise. They say, so the temple architecture of the Govan temples is very much influenced by the Indo-Portuguese architecture. And mind you, I've been all over Portugal, but I've never seen a house like a Govan house uh, in Portugal. Because the veranda and everything. So it was a synthesis. It's a language of architecture which developed here. And one of the best houses, of course, is Dindi Cruises. <laughs> Yeah. And Goa Liberation, so this is General Thapar, father of current Thapar who is a television anchor, who was the general at that time, and um, he signed the treaty. This is a picture which was taken in, Ma in Vasco, uh, where the uh, naval base is there today. And this was the 19th of December, 1961. Uh, this was the route of the Indian Army coming in. I will not go all, all over there, but I think, uh, okay, this story I must tell you. This is Libby Lobos at the side. 
Now Libby Lobo Sardesai and Waman Sardesai. Uh, Waman was her husband and Libby Lobo. Uh, Libby is still alive. Uh, and they were freedom fighters, but very special freedom fighters. Both of them, during the Goa's liberation struggle, took a truck, anchored, parked it in the forest in, uh, uh, in the Sayadris with a transmitter and they were uh, they had their own radio station transmitting news which was encouraging to the freedom fighters of goa they did it for many many uh, months or years and libby is still alive and when uh, jawaharlal nehru and krishna mainan uh, decided to liberate goa uh, they were called because they had a very in good connection with all the freedom fighters. They were called by the Prime Minister and they were, they were discussing, okay, what is happening there. And so they were part of the whole event. And then uh, the general uh, called her and when the Goa was liberated, she was in uh, Belgaum because the base was in Belgaum. And said, what would you like to do now? So Libby said, I would like to just go up in the sky and shout to my people, we are free now. And he actually organized an aeroplane for her. <laughs> and next morning, she was in the aeroplane, a small aeroplane with, uh, with, a, uh, with, a, uh, uh, with a, a loudspeaker attached to it, and she flew over Goa. And before she flew over Goa, the, uh, the general uh, asked her, maybe uh, you could be shot down by the Portuguese. Of course, there were no Portuguese there with the guns. She said, doesn't matter. If I fall down, I will fall on free Goa. So that is what she said. And I interviewed her. She's alive. She stays next to the Panjim Church. And here is a small interview by her. On the 15th of December 1961, the Indian Army started marching towards Goa. So we were getting all the news from the Army as to how they had progressed, where they, what had happened. And we were also communicating this to the people of Goa. The Indian Army came fully prepared. But there was no uh, what you may say, resistance anyway. On the contrary, people used to crowd in front of them to welcome them. Yeah, so this is a little clip from there and I will show you the last film, which is actually uh, an interview of the Foreign Secretary of India called Mr. Kaul. Uh, he uh, was asked basically that uh, India is a non-violent country, a country of Mahatma Gandhi. How come India in the interviewer's term, invaded Goa because BBC was interviewing and I think this is one of the finest interviews I have uh, heard. Uh, I'll skip all this. This is the interview. Mr. Kaur, why has India taken this action against Goa? Because as the Prime Minister said uh, a few weeks ago, India's patience has been exhausted after trying for 14 long years since our independence to settle this problem peacefully. Why didn't you take your case to the United Nations? Uh, well, in the United Nations, Portuguese colonialism in particular has been discussed for several years, but Portugal has refused to give any information or discuss this problem because she believes that all her colonies are extensions of Portugal, a legal fiction which the rest of the world does not accept. And then we did send a letter to the United Nations on the 15th of this month, and uh, we also sent three protests to the Portuguese government. We even said we are prepared to negotiate on the basis that they would eventually withdraw from there. But they refused to discuss this. We opened our diplomatic mission in Lisbon in 1949 in the hope that we'd be able to settle this problem peacefully. But for four long years they tried and we had to close it down because Portugal refused to discuss. And during the last few weeks, Portuguese reinforcements were increased. They were concentrated all along our border. They fired on uh, our merchant ships, on our fish, uh, fish, uh, fishermen's craft. They intruded into our territory on several occasions. And the last straw was on December 17th uh, uh, in the morning when about 300 uh, Portuguese soldiers uh, invaded uh, right across up to 500 yards inside our territory. Then they were committing brutalities, atrocities inside Goa and across the border on our people. Surely no government could tolerate this. But India has always been telling other countries, you told us at Suez, uh, not to use force to settle disputes. Why are you now using force yourself? We have never abjured the use of force as a last resort. We have always advocated the peaceful settlement of disputes as between civilized nations and governments. But you'll forgive me for saying that Portugal is living in medieval ages. 
and they do not understand our language nor your language, if I may say so. For how were we able to settle uh, this similar problem with the French government? Why were we not able to settle with Portugal? Because Portugal still lives in the Middle Ages. She will not see the writing on the wall and the changed atmosphere of the world today. Now, Portugal has taken the case to the United Nations. If the United Nations order a withdrawal, will you agree? It will depend on what the United Nations resolution is, but I do not see how the United Nations, in the same breath, can condemn colonialism for two successive years by an, almost a unanimous vote, and then uh, take back what it has said in the same breath and ask us to withdraw. We are not there to conquer the territory because the territory is part of India. We are not there to dominate a foreign people because the people are our own kith and kin. We're there, there, we have gone there only to help them to liberate themselves. But would you accept the United, United Nations verdict on this? I do not think the United Nations would express such a verdict. Now, there have been reports that the driving force in India behind this move was not Mr. Nehru, but the Defence Minister, Mr. Menon. Have you any comment I on that? I think this is a mischievous report. Neither Mr. Nehru nor Mr. Krishna Menon take such serious steps without consulting the government as a whole. And I can assure you that people of all political parties in India and every Indian citizen and every citizen of Goa is behind this action. If this action had not been taken, there would have been bloodshed and greater violence. It was the lesser of the two evils we had to choose. As, as Mahatma Gandhi said uh, years ago, he said, violence is bad, but slavery is worse. I'm sure the British people would understand and appreciate that sentiment. Over the years, the Indians have built up a, a middle position in the world as a conciliator. Has your government considered that by this attack on Goa, you'll destroy that influence? On the contrary, we feel that it'll help other colonial territories to get freedom peacefully, because I think the powers that control those colonial territories will take a lesson from this and I hope that the transfer of power in other colonial territories will be more peaceful. Thank you. Thank you very much.